start by uh, suggesting something rather strange. If you opened your newspaper tomorrow morning, if you take one that is, and you found that instead of the headline being in large print at the top of the page, it was missing. And then you found it in small print at the bottom of the page. You would think that rather strange. You might, in fact, be a bit upset about it because you rely upon the headline to tell you what's coming in the article or on that page. Well, I don't think that's going to happen with any a real newspaper, but it's something that happened here in the text of our passage. And that when the New Testament was written in Greek, it was written with just capital letters <coughs> called ansios. And also there was no punctuation and there certainly weren't any verses or chapter headings because they have been put in by translators ever since. So in the original Greek there's no indication really of where there is a break or a new theme introduced into the argument. <clears throat> and I believe that there is a headline here in verses 16 and 17. Let me read them to you again. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And the reason I believe that is a new headline, turning over a new page if you like, is because there is such an abrupt difference between verse 15 and verse 16. In verse 15, Paul is finishing his, his analogy with uh, building. And he says, if you are building your life on the foundation that is Christ, then even though you don't do a very good job about it, even though you actually build with wood, hay and stubble, nevertheless, you will be saved. And that's what verse 15 says. But then immediately, in verse 16, he talks about people destroying the temple of God and being destroyed themselves. Nothing very forgiving there, is there? Such an abrupt change in tone, if you like. And that's why I think it is the beginning of a new section. Furthermore, what follows after that headline doesn't make a lot of sense unless it is a new section. Uh, because it covers a lot of ground that's already been covered in chapters 1 and 2. So, so why is Paul repeating himself? Well, the answer is, I think, that up till this point, he has been describing situations. His, his, his teaching has been descriptive of problems, of difficulties in the church, and of many other things. But at verse 16 of chapter 3, description turns into prescription. If you want to know what that means, ask Hannah. <laughs> We're all familiar with prescription, aren't we? we? We don't feel well, we go to the doctor, and um, he first of all describes our, 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 our needs. He, he, he does a diagnosis, which is a descriptive activity. Uh, he says, well, sounds to me as if this is wrong with you and you've got this and so on. Uh, goodbye. Well, not usually. 
he doesn't stop at description. He moves on to prescription. I might actually write out a prescription for a certain medication, uh, but you might also give some uh, good advice. But that's still prescription. And, and so there is this transition I am suggesting in verse 16 of chapter 3, transition from description of the needs and problems of the Corinthian church to prescription, telling them what they've got to do. And he begins with a very clear warning. If any man destroy the temple of God, him God will destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? Now one of the problems of modern translations into English is that they don't distinguish between singular and plural. If you were reading this in the old King James Version, uh, you'd very quickly see that Paul is addressing the Corinthian church as in, in a plural manner. Ye, all of you, you're one temple and you're all members or parts of that temple. And so the temple here is, is not an individual, it is the church at Corinth. And that fits in very well, of course, with um, what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 10, he, he goes on to describe the church, a building as a temple. Uh, we really only need to look at uh, verse 19 onwards. Ephesians 2.19 Now therefore, and he's, he's writing to, to Gentiles, remember here, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in or by the Spirit. I'm talking to Gentiles who say, okay, you've been included, you're in. And we are all together now Jews and Gentiles, that's everybody, Jews and Gentiles being built together as, as living stones, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, you are like living stones, and you're being built together into what? A holy temple. And temples, of course, were places where gods were supposed to live in ancient days. And that is almost borrowed from, from Greek mythology. If you've got a temple, it must be the home or the, the dwelling place of a god. And uh, Paul is borrowing that sort of idea and saying, yes, yes, God does dwell in a temple, but the temple is you, the church. You, the church, collectively, are the temple of God and the temple of God is holy. Why? Because it is inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Now this is a very high view of the local church and it is a view that I don't think many Christians have either understood or embraced. The church is not simply a gathering of people. Uh, the church is not a group of people with common interests. Not even a place where you go and hear the word preached. 
The church is, according to the New Testament, an organic whole. Uh, of course, the other great picture that is used of the church is the picture of the human body. You get this in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, the church is being built and being edified by that which every joint, every part, every component contributes. And every, com every part, every component, meaning every person in the church, has something to contribute. And a church will only function properly if people recognise that they're not just meeting on a Sunday, but that they are an organic union with other members. We are members uh, in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, Paul says this, we are members one of another. We are joined together into a holy temple. Even a small company like our own, if we are meeting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are a temple, corporately a temple of the Holy Spirit. And it's when you grasp that fact that the local church becomes important. And that's why I say I think many, many Christians don't understand it. There are quite a lot of Christians who are uh, spiritual gypsies. They go from one church to another. Well, they say, what does it matter? I'm hearing the word of God preach. That's fine. That's all that matters. I don't have to belong to a church. I don't have to go to one church regularly. I can go to any church I like and take what I want. That is to completely misunderstand the biblical nature of a local church. And even those people who are very faithful at attending one church, I think, seldom understand what it is that they are participating in. They are members of a temple. They are parts of a temple, components of a temple, bricks, if you like, stones in a, a, a temple building. I just would add one writer to that. When you get to chapter 6 of this epistle, Paul uses the same metaphor of the individual. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit that you have from God and that you are not your own? You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and soul, which are God's. In that case, he takes exactly the same metaphor and says it applies to the individual. And, and, and there's no contradiction there because a metaphor is obviously flexible. Any given metaphor or picture language can be applied to a whole range of different things. And Paul is using it in that way. But there is no question that here and in Ephesians 2 and in Peter, the temple is the church. And we must grasp that. Because if we grasp it, we shall be able to understand why Paul is so vehement about this question. If any man destroys the temple of God, him will God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Why? Because the Spirit of God dwells in that temple. So then, let us grasp that. And let us understand why Paul goes on now to say that certain things which don't look all that important are potentially destructive of a local church. Obviously he's talking about the Corinthian church, but I think we can generalise his statements. But before we do that, <clears throat> I want to draw something really positive out of this apparently very negative statement, if any man destroy uh, the temple of God. 
a, a temple would have reminded the people of Paul's day of the ancient Mosaic temple, the temple of the Old Covenant. Certainly it would have reminded any, any Jews, but I think also it would have reminded the Gentile Ephesians because they had been introduced to the Old Testament because the Gospel is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So they understood a lot of the Old Testament. Now, in, in the opening chapters of the book of Revelation, chapter 1 in particularly, and if you look at verse 13, the Apostle John is having a vision of the glorified Christ. And he says in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. And then uh, we look again at verse 20 of Revelation 1. The mystery or the secret of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels, the messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now, Christ is pictured in Revelation as walking among the seven churches. And that is clearly a picture of Christ's proximity to the seven churches. The book of Revelation was written to seven churches in Asia Minor. And that would have reminded them of the old-fashioned temple, if you like, the old covenant temple, where a, a vital piece of furniture was the menorah, which was a seven-branched lampstand. And the priests had, among other things, as their daily task to look after the lampstand, make sure the oil was replaced, was filled, and make sure that the smoking flax was not quenched, in other words, make sure that the, the wicks didn't give off smoke. And, and remember that in, in, the, in the Mosaic Temple, there was only one source of light in the place where the priests worked, and that was the seven-branched lampstand. Now, in Revelation, it's interesting that it's not a seven-branched lampstand, there are seven individual lampstands, which perhaps tells us that local churches are independent of one another. They are self-governing in New Testament thinking. But the important thing is this. What is Christ doing in Revelation 1? And remember, he's dressed as a priest. Garment down to his ankles, white garment, band uh, across his, his chest. What is he doing walking among the seven lampstands? Well, of course, he's watching what's going on. He knows what's going on. He's close, he's near, he's present. But also, he is tending the lampstand. He's tending the light. And we shall see presently at the end of the message uh, how important that is. So it is a, it's a positive message. If we, if we make those associations that I have made with Revelation 1 and the Old Testament temple, and we now say that the temple is now us, the gathered people of a, a local church, we see that Christ must be close to us. He must be among us, indeed, he says, where two or three are gathered in my name. I am there by his Holy Spirit. And the 
reality of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the corporate temple, the local church, is manifested. We rely upon the presence of the Holy Spirit here and now. We rely upon the presence of Christ through his Holy Spirit to make sure that our meeting is not useless, to make sure that the word of God does not return to him void, to make sure that we go away edified and hopefully to some extent uplifted by what we have learned and heard, that we go away having truly worshipped God in our singing, but in our thinking as well. So then it's a positive message, but it is nevertheless a severe warning and a strong prescription. Well, let's go on then uh, to the remainder of what I have to say. If you follow through in the uh, passage we're looking at, you'll notice that there are three repetitions of uh, the word let no one or let a person right at the beginning after he's given this warning in verse 17 in verse 18 we read this let no one deceive himself in verse 21 we read therefore let no one boast in men and later on in verse 1 of chapter 4 let a man so consider us and those three uses of the word uh, are not to be taken lightly. They are, in fact, prescriptions. God is telling people what to do in order to avoid destroying the church. <laughs> and uh, he, is, he is saying, by implication, but not far off in plain words, he is saying that destruction will follow if these injunctions are not observed. Uh, let's look at verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. It is written, he catches the wise in their own carelessness, and the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. You see, one danger that the apostle sees, a danger that doesn't look too bad at first, but which he sees as potentially destructive of the local church, is the employment of worldly wisdom in the affairs and conduct of a church. Let anyone, let no one, deceive himself if anyone among you among you talking about people in the church seems to be wise in this age let him become a fool that he might become wise so from the discussion earlier in chapter two of course of uh, uh, the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of god uh, what he's basically saying here is that god is going to destroy the wisdom of the world bring it to nothing cause it to end up uh, in futility and that these people in the church at Corinth who were using or implying the wisdom of the world in the conduct of that church were capable of destroying the church thereby and he says urgently look give up that wisdom become a fool as far as that wisdom is concerned turn away from that wisdom and turn to a wisdom that God accepts, the wisdom of God. Throw away the wisdom of the world, you must return to the wisdom of God. Otherwise, you will destroy the church. And you know, that is a principle that one sees at work today. Uh, how many illustrations could one give? Think of uh, the pronouncement a few days ago by the Archbishop of Canterbury, once considered to be an evangelical. What did he say? 
He said, it's perfectly right to teach children of the age of five in Church of England schools all about homosexuality. Absolutely right, because we are an inclusive church. Of course, it's absolutely wrong, but that's the wisdom of the world. The standards and the mores, morals of the world have seeped into that church. And they have done so to such a, a great extent and have been doing so for so long that um, uh, one Archbishop of York during my lifetime uh, didn't believe in the resurrection of Christ. He was second in command in the Church of England. Well, let, let's just find an example because it's going on now. Uh, what, what many churches are doing, it's not just the Church of England, many churches, um, <clears throat> both denominations and individual churches, are looking out and seeing, well, what does the world believe? What, what, is the, what is the accepted wisdom concerning all kinds of issues in the world around us? Well, we'd better fit in with that. we better adopt their standards. we better adopt their worldviews, uh, because otherwise we should be pushed out onto the, onto the edge of society. But that's where the church ought to be. <laughs> because the church is functioning, or ought to be functioning, on the wisdom of God, not on the wisdom of the world. And the infiltration of the wisdom of the world into a church is utterly destructive. And, and so just pointing out that when the values of the world and the focuses of the world, wisdom of the world, wealth and power, when these things become the priorities in a church, and I say not just the Roman Catholic Church, goes to most of the major denominations today, then that church has been destroyed. It may continue, it may even thrive as a social centre, but it's no longer a church. It's no longer a church which has the power to transform lives and to bring people from spiritual death to spiritual life. Well then, let's move on. What's the second thing uh, he talks about here? Therefore, in verse 21, therefore let no man boast in man. And here again, of course, we have um, a serious problem uh, because in, in many churches, one or more individuals have been granted total power. They are the only people who can make decisions they are the only people who can tell other people what to do. They are the only people who can control the assets of the church. They are the only people who have any absolute and ultimate control of the church. Now, you see this, of course, in, in, in the various sects that uh, arise. But you also see it in evangelical churches. And when one person, given control, uh, that's perhaps how it happens so often. Therefore let no one boast in men. And that happens in, and I've seen it happen. I mean, I've been around a long time, been a Christian for 70 years, and I've traveled the world quite extensively and seen a lot of churches in other countries as well as in this country. I uh, had edited Evangelical Times which was his fingers and tentacles out into all uh, the British churches that call themselves Evangelical. And again and again and again I have seen churches destroyed by the lionization, the, the elevation of a single person 
who is now the person who has the following and they follow the person rather than following Christ. And that church is destroyed as a spiritual entity, as a New Testament church. It doesn't exist anymore. And uh, you see, Paul uh, amplifies that, doesn't he? Let no one boast in men. Does one person in your church, or perhaps a small group of people in your church, say that they possess all power, all authority? No, he says. All things are yours. If you are a genuine church, then you have not yielded up ultimate authority to other people. You have not given the assets of the church into the control and hands of a few leaders. He said, all things belong to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, here are people, but we, you don't belong to us. We belong to you. It's the other way round. Or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. He said, they all belong to you. Why? Because you, because you belong to Christ. And these things belong to Christ. And Christ shares them with you. So the danger, the second danger that is identified here, the second thing that will destroy a church if it is not corrected, is the elevation of certain human beings uh, to ultimate authority in a church. And then the third thing in verse 1 of chapter 4, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. Uh, you see, this statement, let a man, let everyone, that is, understand that we are servants, that, that, that either, uh, whether it's Apollos or Paul or Cephas, we are servants. I suppose this is emphasizing what he said in the previous verse. You don't belong to us. You are not our subjects as subjects of a king or royalty. We are your servants. We belong to you in in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, Paul says, we preach Christ as Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Christ's sake. And so he's reminding them what is already said in verse 22 of chapter 3, reminding them that he is a servant of Christ and that it is required of him to be faithful. But then he goes on with the real problem he's driving at. He says, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. You see, Paul was under intense criticism in Corinth. But that emerges much more clearly in the second letter to the Corinthians. But he was, he was criticised profoundly. And every time a little group, I call them fan clubs, were set up, you've got a group who are supporting Paul, yes, but you've also got a group who are supporting Apollos, and they say, Paul is no use, he's not good, he's no good, he can't preach very well. He's got a funny voice, he's only a small man. Don't take any notice of Paul. Uh, Paulus, this 
great upstanding man speaking beautiful Greek uh, and tremendous knowledge of the Old Testament. Here's the man you ought to follow. Um, but, but Paul has said, and he said it again and again, look, we are servants. We are doing what God has told us to do. We are being faithful, yes, but we're being faithful not to your wishes, not to your desires, but to God himself. And so he goes on, don't judge me, he says. Don't judge me, because if you start judging your preachers and your leaders and your servants, then you will destroy the church. You will bite and devour one another. He says this in the Galatians, doesn't he? Uh, be careful, he says, if you bite and devour one another, that you do not consume one another. Uh, and that's what happens, of course. If you get criticism, if you get the one group criticizing one person, different group criticizing another, that utterly destroys the unity of the church. And if the church is a temple, then it's like taking a, a wrecking ball to a building. You're going to destroy it. So let me just finish by going back to Revelation. And here we see an example of the real dangers that Paul is drawing attention to in the passage we've looked at. <clears throat> dangers which can destroy a church. And in chapter 2 and verse 1, we have the first of the seven letters to churches, and this one is to Ephesus, to the angel, the messenger of the church of Ephesus, right? These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, there we are, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, that you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Great church, okay? I'm sure any church would want to have that commendation from the Lord. Great church, great works. You're doing a great, great job. Can't fault you at any point. Oh, just a minute. But, he goes on. Nevertheless, verse 4, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Here is a church which at first sight uh, appears to be the perfect church. Tremendous commendation from the Lord. But he says, you're going to destroy the church. Or if you like, I'm going to destroy the church because I'm going to take your lampstand away. It won't be there anymore. Why? What's wrong? Because they had left their first love. And that departure from a love of Christ, and it must be that, of course, it can't be anything else, that departure from a love of Christ wipes out all their good deeds, all their good works, everything that they pride themselves in, everything that the Lord can commend them for, is going to be erased quickly, he says. I'm going to come quickly and I'm going to remove your lampstand. There's not going to be a church there anymore. 
just because they've got to return to their first work. So, well, what works is Paul talking about? Well, he's talking about the same works as he praises, not Paul, the Lord. What, uh, what works is the Lord talking about? Well, they are the same works as he has just been praising, but they have been performed, they have been performed with the wrong motive. He's not saying these are works you've done, uh, these are different works that you should do. What he's saying is these are the works that you have done and you should have done them motivated by a love for me. But you haven't. You've drifted away from that. You're doing these good works and they are good works but you're doing them for the wrong reason. And you know that brings us back down to motivation. Why do we do things? As Christians if we are to preserve the temple of the church then we must do the things we do out of love for Christ because there is no other motive that God will accept. Well there we must leave it but it leaves us I think with a very real challenge but I hope a greater understanding of what it means to be a local church. <laughs>